Hello. Hello, 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 everybody. I'm so glad that you could make it. I learned some new things on my, my fancy computer software, how to put a different, uh, take a picture of myself and put up a screenshot of myself. So it's not just the book while well, we're all waiting. So that was a, sort of exciting for me today. So thanks for coming. I'm Kelly Vaughn from Knit Swag and this is Number Knitting. We, this week, like every week, are gonna be talking about number knitting, the new always stretch method from Virginia Woods Bellamy, published in 1952, had a print run of 5,000 and then it fell into obscurity, but we're bringing it back, folks. We are bringing it back. I have had, it's been, I think, two weeks since we were here, because last week was Easter, and um, yeah, so it's been a couple weeks since we've we've been together. I've been working on a lot of um, a lot of projects. Well, not a lot, like four, <laughs> which for me is a lot because I normally just do uh, just do one one project at a time. Hey, Anita. Hey, Karen. Welcome, welcome. So um, anyway, uh, let's. I I had I know we in the past couple of weeks we had. Um, we had been going over some McCall's uh, needlework magazines, and the reason was because those magazines were where Virginia originally got her, her patterns um, displayed. They actually weren't published in the magazines, but they were, they were advertised in the magazines. And um, from there, the, the viewers or the readers could go and order a pamphlet from, um, from McCall's and we've managed to track down one of them. I think she published a total of two pamphlets through McCall's and we got one of them from the, the library in Chicago. Um, the other one, I don't know if there's a physical hard copy anywhere, so I'm still, I'm still trying to track that down. I think, I think I might have found someone who might have it, but I'm not quite sure yet. So I need to do a little bit more digging but anyway, it got me thinking about this this whole idea of um, preserving preserving all these magazines and how important important it is for us to have this this bit of history uh, for for the future. And I wanted to show you some. Um, hey, Hope, welcome. Um, a new idea that I had that I thought was going to be awesome. It turns out it wasn't awesome. <laughs> But um, it was an idea I had about a way to preserve these magazines, and I, I want to show it to you. Let me, let me clear off my desk a little, a little bit. Today, I've got the fourth camera, so this is exciting. So this is the one I've had for a while. It's the overhead shot where I can show you the, you know, things laid out. And I think, I think I might need to adjust my camera. Does that look a little blown out to you? Because on my screen, it looks a tad blown out. So I think we might need to dial in the... Um, the exposure a bit. Next week, next week we will do it. And so um, I, I've been ordering, kind of like on an ordering spree of these, um, whoop, not that one, there we go, an ordering spree of these um, these magazines and um, no one, as far as I can tell, no one has digitized these and it's important that we save this history and I think I think part of the reason that no one has digitized these magazines is <laughs> seriously these things are huge like this is probably like an 11 by 14 or 11 by 16 or something and I know a lot of people have got flatbed scanners at home or a lot of people used to have flatbed scanners a lot of offices have flatbed scanners but they'll like fit you know eight and a half by 11 like I had one of those for years but to have a flatbed scanner that fits a monstrosity like this like the <laughs> You don't just generally pick one of those up at you know Office Depot. You have to special order them, and they're not as expensive as they used to be. Um, but it's not the kind of thing that very many people have. And so, I've been thinking it would be a good idea for me to get one of these because I think the the size format of this is why no one has done it. Because you know you'd have to work in a library for research, you know, academia or something. Because not many people have a gigantic flatbed scanner in their house. So here's my idea. Hey, Mishi B, welcome, welcome. Um, I have, and I, I tested it out a little bit. 
and it worked okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up um, I'm gonna show you my phone. Let's see camera four. There's my phone, and I'm gonna open up the Adobe Scan app. And I know this is a this is a knitting this is a knitting podcast, but I think this is important enough that you might find it useful for your own knitting. And so what happens is Adobe Scan is gonna look for a document. Just it just does it automatically. Open it up and I think you might have to sign in. I'm already signed in. And it automatically saves this. And you can like drag these little handles around if you, you know, if you want to adjust it. Um, and you know, then I could do the next page, which is which is fine. It's gonna look for the next page, it's gonna look for the borders. That's great. But here's where it's really cool. And I, I discovered this last week. I haven't used this in a while. So if you click on the book function, turn the phone sideways. Let's see if I can, there we go. I gotta stand up a little bit to do it. And what it does is it, it saves it as two pages and breaks it apart. And so now, if I go to save the PDF, I'll just call this McCall's and um, I'm going to save it. Now here, here, that was a big mistake, but um, what this is going to let me do, oh, here now it's working. Try this again. All right, I'm going to copy the link. Good gracious. <laughs> and I'm going to send it to myself and I'm going to paste it into the um, the comments so you can all see what I just made in the you can all download it right now and look at it all right so I'm going to send that to myself and I'm going to go grab that real quick Here we go. All right, I just pasted that into the comments. <coughs> and so that is the document that I just that I just scanned with Adobe Scan. And even though that demo was pretty bad failure, <laughs> pretty bad failure, I'm gonna, um, I think it's, it's, I wanted to show you all that so that you could you could see even if you don't have a flatbed scanner or um, you know even, like you've probably if you're like me you, if you want to take a picture if you want to have like a pattern with you but you don't have a PDF of it and so you might like take a picture of it on your phone and then just like the, the picture gets lost in your camera roll on your phone what you can do is use Adobe scan and just take a picture of it for your own personal use and um, just keep it with you and and I think that's that's something that we as knitters can do to help preserve um, preserve these old these old works, these old magazines. Because if we just leave all that up to the um, the archivist, like they don't have enough time and energy and funding to do all that. And so, as um, individuals, we can help preserve this history. And Adobe Scan is um, is an easy way to do it. Now, it's not the best it's not the best file quality. Like if I was to um, if I was to bring up one of those, and I'm going to actually bring up the scan, not my tax documents again. Good gracious! <sighs> oh dear! It only wants to bring up my tax documents. Oh Adobe, you're killing me! You're killing me! Anyway. The, um, is it gonna work? I think it's gonna work. The file quality is not, not awesome, but it is, it is better than nothing. All right, let's try this, uh, try this again. So here is the one I just scanned, and it's, you know, it's not great. In the original, the original, um, version, like there was this big pink background here, and that totally got wiped out, and so, it, when it's a full color page, it does eh, it does all right, but when it's um, not a full color page, sometimes it's going to blow out the background and make things 
a little harder to see. So it's not like archival quality, um, but it is better, better than nothing. So anyway, that is the, um, the demo of the day. All right. So um, I found another interesting design this week that blew my mind and it's modular knitting. And um, well, of course, it's, of course it's modular knitting. That's all I talk about here. Um, but if, let me show you, um, check this out. So this is a mitered, this is like short rows. It's sort of a mitered square, but she, what she did is um, she started in the corner and did um, fair aisles, fair aisle, and then she incorporated pictures into mitered knitting. And this thing just blew my mind because I know I like to combine like pooled knitting and modular knitting. I think that's really fun. But like whenever you find two knitting techniques that like um, kind of intersect, you can get something really amazing and i've never seen anyone do fair isle with um modular knitting before that just it's awesome and i have a link to that down in the description she also has a whole um she it offered free instructions on it which i thought was really neat yeah so that was something interesting i saw this week okay so regarding regarding these um these McCall's magazines, I have decided that I'm going to, I'm going to collect them all. <laughs> I think I've got about 10 of them right now. I don't know how long the McCall's was published. I think it was like the 19, McCall's Needlework specifically. I think it was 19, 1940s up until the 80s. I'm more interested in like 40s, 50s, maybe into the 60s. So those are kind of the ones I'm concentrating on. But you know, that could grow. Um, but for now, those are those are the ones I'm really interested in. And um, I've decided that um, I want to put out a goal. I know we have, we I get a, a, maybe a couple new subscribers every week, which is awesome. I'm up to 328 now, or maybe 329. I think I got another one earlier today. Um, but once I get to 1,000 subscribers, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pay the copyright office the money to get, um, to do the copyright research on this. And uh, I did that, I think probably like in 2016 or 17, I actually did that with, with number knitting. And they, um, I paid them the $400 and they did the copyright research to let me know, yes, it's in the public domain. They sent me like the notarized letter or whatever with the stamp on it. So it's like all official, but the, it's a minimum charge of $200 an hour, ching for two hours. Um, but they said that to do copyright research on McCall's needlework would be $400. Like, okay, so here's my goal. Once we get to 1,000 subscribers, which I don't know, I don't know how soon that'll happen, um, but once we do, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the trigger and pay the copyright office 400 bucks to do copyright transfer research on that to see if it is in the public domain. And the reason I wanna do that is because uh, I want to also scan all those old magazines in and make them available for researchers because I know that there are researchers in like, you know, different fashion departments and universities around the country that would love, love, love to get their hands on those scans. And so that's what, that's what I'm going to do to help preserve, preserve history. So I'm going to, I'm going to pay the copyright office, the 400 bucks, and then get a scanner. So goals. <laughs> All right, let's see if there's any comments going on. There we go. Oh, 332. Wow. Wow, I got like five new subscribers today. That warms my heart. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. Mm. <laughs> Whenever I get a new one, I tell Steve, Steve is my husband, honey, I got a new subscriber. And he's like, that's nice. <laughs> like, whenever I show my new knitting projects, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I love him. That's all right. He has his things. He's a tech guy. I don't know if you saw the, the little video short that I posted recently on YouTube and Instagram. He's a tech guy. And so he set me up with all these lights, the camera, the switcher, like all the gear. Yeah, that's his thing. And so I'm super grateful for that. He's awesome. Um, oh, um, Mishibi says you might consider keeping a list of what you have and you don't have. 
when I'm at a garage sale shopping, I might come across them. You know, let me show you what, um, what I have in that department. I have a, um, I don't know if I've showed you all this before. Let me open that up so you can see it. Zoom in a bit. There we go. And I will show you my screen. So this is a little database that I made. And um, this has got all the, the different magazines that I've been collecting. And I, I added a, um, a picture of it down here and any kind of notes about what's, um, what's noteworthy. I've, I've got that in here. Um, and so I've also got if I've purchased them or not. And so I do already have a, um, a collection of them and like what I, um, I still need to get. But you know what I could do is I could put that um, I could put that like on the website somewhere. So um, if y'all came across them, you could you could check. Anyway, that's my little database. I, lo I love databases. I love having a place to like dump all of the information that I collect. You know, some people they collect other, um, I don't know, spoons or recipes or whatever. I collect data. <laughs> and documents. Woo! <laughs> How big is your PDF collection? Mine's pretty big. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to talk next about about knitting needles and if you can, oh yeah, I have some. Um, so let's bring up, let's bring up the new camera. So this is the um, the old one that, you know, we're familiar with that, that the big one. We set up a secondary one, check this out. It's close up, ooh, so we can see, you guys can see my hands better. So that's exciting. Um, so I'll actually be able to do like techniques and stuff. And so I wanted to talk about the, um, the knitting needles because I just, I think it's kind of, um, I think it's worthwhile to just give it some consideration. Now, I was I was chatting with um, I forget who it was. I think it might have been Mishi B in the Ravelry group, and she was saying that she just got some um, some new stiletto needles, which are awesome. I from what I've heard and the price point, they look awesome. They're um, they're um, very finely high, like highly machined, highly polished steel needles, very sharp, uh, and they look great. I think they, I know they come in interchangeables. I don't like the clickety clack of metal needles. And so I usually use like a bamboo or wood. Um, I've also, I love, love, love these little prim plastic ones. Um, but I was just wondering what, what kind of needles do you all like? Because I, I find like with some yarns, they're just, they're, um, and some needles, like these are bamboo needles. These are size 13. It's like a light fingering weight. Uh, this is the bodice blouse with cape scarf that we're working on. And um, I find that certain yarns really need more grippy needles um, just because it's, it makes it harder. Like if, it's, if the needles aren't grippy enough, the yarn just like slides off of them. Like this, this is a really challenging knit because the needles, um, the yarn is just so thin in comparison to the needles. So I just thought it would be, you know, worthwhile to talk about if you have, um, you know, the funds or like the, the length of time, like the length of years knitting where you have like accumulated a bigger knitting collection, a knitting needle collection, like what kinds do you guys prefer? You know, because when we started out, I don't know about you, but when I started out, I was like trying to knit with chopsticks and, you know, the whatever aluminum, chipped aluminum needles from... Um, you know, Walmart or whatever that people gave to me after grandma died. <laughs> and so, um, but you know, as we get older, we get more, more funds and, you know, we have more time, we invest in better needles. So I, um, anyway, that was a little knitting needle diversion. Rose said, you like chai goo? I do too. 
collage square i haven't tried those ones yet um oh and mishibi likes pure metal you know i i don't mind the clickety clack but steve love him he's very sensitive to to the clicks he's an audio guy and so if he can hear the clicking he's <laughs> He'd prefer to not hear the clicking, and so I think the first priority for me is finding the quietest needle possible, um, which is usually the, the bamboo or the plastic. They're very quiet, and then I try to knit very delicately, and it's, um, it's peaceful then. <laughs> so, uh, Chao Gu Interchangeables. I, wa I want to love interchangeables. I really do. I really do. And I even have a set. I think they're called Likeys. And... Um, and you have to interchange them and there's like that little twisty thing that you put on there to lock it down but i don't know what it is about my knitting some over time the little the little the connection point where it screws together it like kind of starts to come undone and then the yarn catches on it but like if i'm on a trip like a road trip or something i'm not going to bring the entire set with the little the little locking device with me and so i just like to hand tighten it manually and then it comes unscrewed again so i really I really want to love interchangeables, but I have a pretty massive collection of fixed <laughs> that I <laughs> that I always go to, even if they're the wrong length. It's it's crazy. Haya Haya and collage. Yeah, I've tried the Addies, the super super turbos or whatever. Mm -mm, they're too slick for me. I like to go I like to go pretty slow um, with well. I like the option to go slow. Um, I'm actually a pretty fast knitter, but I, I like I like the grippiness of bamboo better. All right, so um, I did want to talk about the sometimes probably like half the time I'll put little links to books down below, and um, what those are those are Amazon affiliate links. And in case you don't know, because I I know a lot of a lot of YouTubers probably don't really talk about it. Um, if you click on one of those links and then buy something on Amazon, even if it's not like the link to the book, but like if you went out and bought, I don't know, almond flour or like cream of chicken soup or I don't know, fireplace or like whatever you buy on Amazon, after you click, like I think it's within 24 hours after you click that link, I could get a small portion, like a, a very small commission. And uh, so far with my Amazon affiliate links, I've made 86 cents. <laughs> which I also was equally excited about and I told Steve I made 86 cents so um, because I, I know if you wanted to help support this effort with all the gear and this you know the scanning and like the research and all that that is a way to do it that wouldn't actually cost you any money because Amazon just pays it so if you click one of the links doesn't matter which link and then go buy anything on Amazon I might probably would get a, a small very small commission on it so that's just something to consider um, yeah, and you can also like and subscribe that that will help as well because we're a pretty small channel um, so far and um, I think how many of this oh there's 10 of us here right now that's exciting yeah there's 10 of us and so um, but you know as we grow uh, liking and subscribing will help this get in front of more people um, also, what you could do is if you like this, if you like what we're doing with the chatting and like the cameras and all that and the modular knitting, tell a friend, tell a knitting friend so they can, they can hear about it too. Um, yeah, you are my knitting friends and I've already told all of you. So <laughs> I should do better on Instagram though. I, 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 I should get better on Instagram. I'll put it on my list of things to do. I don't talk about this video setup enough over there, but there's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> Okay, um, so I have been looking at different knitting books, as I do, and you may have heard me tell this story before about a few years ago, my friend Jackie, she was a knitting teacher, and but she was downsizing, and she said, Kelly, I'm cleaning out, downsizing. I want you to have all my knitting books for $100, a lifetime collection of knitting books. She's like, but you got to take them all. <laughs> so filled up my Jeep for 100 bucks worth of knitting books. And so I've got this pretty mass, and I sold like half of them, um, but I have a pretty massive collection. And what I like to do is go through, I, I, especially I saved, I didn't save uh, all of them, 
well, obviously, because I sold a bunch of them. But what I like to do is I kept all the ones related to garter stitch and modular knitting. And when I first got them, I was like, well, these patterns aren't that innovative. Like Virginia's book is way better. Um, but then as, as I'm going through number knitting more, and I'm, I'm getting like a better handle on how she organized it, I'm then able to compare that with the other modular knitting books that are kind of that are like in the same vein and see how they're structured in comparison um, and I think it's really interesting and so I just wanted to show you a couple of those today uh, so let's look at let's look at Virginia's book first and if you're new here um, what I did is after I got the copyright um, transfer search from the US Copyright Office, I, I, so I digitized the whole thing and I made it available as an ebook, like a PDF download in my website and my Etsy shop. And um, so I have the physical hard copy, but um, I also have the, the, um, I have the whole thing as an, um, an ebook as well. The whole thing and it's all keyword searchable and bookmarks and you know everything i colorized the photos um but anyway let's take a look and see how how virginia organized her book and i think it's actually easier to see on this digital version that it is in the, the hard copy version because i um i broke out the bookmarks a little bit easier to see and so she has um five or six main sections how to number knit number knitting and flat design uh, which is like shawls and that sort of thing um, shawls and scarves and um, blankets she's got some blankets in there and then she's also um, yep designs on rectangles she she does it like designs on rectangles designs on squares designs on triangles and so she kind of shape she organizes her designs um, by like what shape they're comprised of um, and then she has um, costume design for children where she goes through um, how to make you know use all those shapes to make baby clothes and then costume design for men and women and um, I'll show you I actually finished this blouse and I'll show you that here in a bit um, and then she has a whole section called to the adventurous knitter and so it's it's interesting to me the way that she organized hers in um, first in shapes and then in garments for babies and adults so anyway let's take a look and see how a, another a couple of knitting um, knitting books are organized this is a this is the second I believe it was the second book by Vivian Hawksborough her first one was domino knitting and I've showed you that before and I have a link to that down below I have misplaced it it's it's somewhere here in my studio or maybe it's in my office I have a copy <laughs> and it's you know it's bookmarked and everything but I just can't find it at the moment but this is her um, her second book which I think is interesting because because while Virginia does uh, like shapes that are um, she used seven seven different shapes um, the square the rectangle, the triangle, the divided triangle, the divided square, and the trapezoid. She calls it a wing. Oh, and then the, the double wing. So she, d she has seven shapes. What's interesting to me about Vivian's work is that she almost exclusively uses mitered squares. And um, this book specifically uses mitered squares. I don't know if it uses any other shapes. I'm not sure. Um, but her first one is knit squares and blocks and then chapter two is about joining them join two blocks into a pouch and so she's got several um, things about joining two blocks chapter three is joining three blocks chapter four is joining four blocks and chapter five is knitting in complete blocks and it's it's a totally different way of of organizing the information than um, than Virginia did. She she does have information about how to knit, um, like all of her all of her blocks. They're mitered squares. 
she uses um, an uneven number of stitch and does a centered double decrease where Virginia uses an even number of stitch stitches and does a um, a double decrease on either side of a stitch marker but she in in Vivian's first book she actually um, mentions number knitting in the in the section like in the kind of the intro and uh, um, you know about how Virginia had come up with this method and what I think is is interesting about Vivian's work is she she has you do these um, like little paper mock-ups which uh, I haven't I haven't seen before but she uses the, the same idea in that the the units are numbered and it the, the orientation of the numbers indicates what direction they're to be knit and she uses a very similar graphing technique to Virginia. Now Virginia doesn't use, um, Vivian, I'm sorry, doesn't use the, the graph paper like Virginia does. Like Virginia has, you know, actually grids behind this, but, um, but Vivian doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, but she does some really interesting, interesting little mock-ups with uh, her designs. So if, if you wanted to do like, see more like three-dimensional, kinds of um, kinds of designs. This is an interesting book. I've seen some granny square slippers kind of in the same vein. Like if you can knit a granny square and you know make a make it into a sweater or pouch or whatever, you can do the same thing with a mitered square, a mitered knitted square. Um, and so if you see a granny square sweater that you like, you could just copy it and do it in mitered squares. So anyway, that is the first book I wanted to show you. Um, all about joining joining the um, the blocks together so this is a good read and I one thing that kind of um, I wasn't so sure about this book for a long time because it's it is in color and while while Virginia's work is um, is very it's almost like haute couture it's usually all the sweaters are I think almost always in one color and so she did her, um, her innovation was like using the gauge shifting to do the shaping, which is really nice. Um, but, but Vivian's work is more colors as opposed to gauge shifting. I haven't seen her do any gauge shifting in any of her, um, her patterns. <coughs> but if you like that style, it's, um, it's very cool. It's a good read, you know, even if it's just for educational. Like, I've never actually knit anything from those books, but I think it's a, it's a worthwhile study. Okay, so the second book I wanted to show you is called Modular Knits, Irish Shears, Innovative and Easy Techniques. Now, there's two different, two different books by Irish Shearer. Forgive me, I do not know how to pronounce that name. I'm pretty sure I messed it up. Um, but anyway, they're both about modular knits and they have two different covers. One was like um, a hardback and one was a paperback and they have similar names. And so I don't know if they're the, but they were published in the same year. So I don't know if they're the same book or not. I, I haven't been able to tell. And I only have this one. I don't have the, the hardback one. Okay, so let's see how she organizes her information. She has... Um, the basics of modular knitting with short rows, and then she talks about vertical and horizontal garter stitch squares. Then she moves into triangles and diamonds. And um, she said, chapter four, I wasn't able to figure this out, unmitered or center increase shapes. But when I went to that page, because I was like, what the heck is an unmitered or center increase shape? They're all, <laughs> they're all mitered which is odd. Maybe, because that's a mitered, Virginia would have called that a divided triangle, divided square, divided square. Like, I don't know what's not mitered about that. Um, I'm not sure. But what is interesting about this book is she talks about how to um, do center increase shapes as well as center decrease shapes. And I think somewhere... Yeah, here it is. So in in Virginia's book, she has um, 
She has a pattern called the divided triangle scarf. And all of her patterns are started by casting on the long edge and then decreasing in the middle. And so you work only decreases and you work up. And so you're going to decrease here at the edges and then do a double decrease here. And that works great. But if you are playing yarn chicken, which is how I roll, that's, <laughs> that's a little scary. And so what you can do if you're playing yarn chicken and you don't know how much yarn you need, you just want to use up what you have, what you can do is work it the opposite way, which is what Iris described in her book. So you, um, you start with like four stitches and then you do a, a double increase in the center and a single increase on either side every other row. And so you can work, um, you can work until you run out of yarn. And Virginia mentioned that like as a, like as a footnote in, in kind of the, to the adventuresome knitting knitter section. She just mentioned that you can work them in reverse, but she didn't give any instructions about that. But um, Iris had like a whole chapter all about working things in reverse, which I thought, I thought was interesting. I think, you know, the more we dive into modular knitting, it's Im important to see the, the history, but also what modern knitting, you know, authors and designers are, are doing to like keep, you know, further the development of, um, of the technique. Um, and I don't know, because I, I do know that Vivian specifically mentioned Virginia and the the woman or no the man that Vivian learned from Horst Schultz he mentioned um, Virginia I believe pretty sure I need to do some research on that and so people in the modular knitting like the you know the big wigs in the modular knitting world they're very much aware of um, of Virginia but they 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 go and they do their um, their own thing which is great but here on this channel we have so much to learn from Virginia, so I'm just going to keep plugging away <laughs> on all of her patterns until until I've knitted them all, and then um, I'll probably just do it again. Speaking of Virginia, okay, so we had a discussion last week about um, Stephanie, I believe, suggested I should get the mannequin, and I had a mannequin. She was living downstairs, and so I brought her upstairs, and um, then we decided she needed a name. And Karen suggested we should name her Virginia. So welcome, welcome Virginia. Uh, I need to give her a hat or something. Uh, I don't know if she's well lit enough. This is my first time. Uh, I guess I need Steve in here to like dial in the um, the lighting a bit, but that's okay. We will get that figured out. But this is Virginia, um, the model, and I uh, welcome Virginia. Yay! Round of applause. All right, so I wanted to show you a couple of things that I that that she's wearing. Okay, the first one. This is um, this is the I think it's called the double the double wing butterfly scarf. Let me let me bring it up in the um, the book real quick. And the way that it was showed off in the book was kind of, um, it was kind of odd, the way she was wearing it. And I was thinking about that, how, um, here we go, how I just wasn't sure about, about this. Okay, so according to the book, you're supposed to put, put it, over your head so put it like over your head and then you cross the cross these wingtips in front and to me this looks a little goofy to me for my modern aesthetic but I was thinking about how back in the 50s it was a lot more common for women to wear like like I have pictures of my grandmother wearing a plastic rain hood so that she wouldn't, you know, mess up her, her updo. Um, but even like if you think about, you know, women going to church in the 40s and 50s, they had to wear a head covering. Like it didn't have to be functional. It was just like part of 
going to church back then in some churches. And so maybe, maybe this whole idea of just like a little veil um, to cover your head, maybe that was like more, I think it was probably more normal. Um, now I, f I feel like, I don't know, Middle Eastern or something wearing this. It's, it's not bad. I mean, it could grow on me. But um, anyway, this is the double wing, the double wing butterfly shawl that I, that I just finished. And um, I made it in a delicate shell pink, just like Virginia had said to, with a, um, I did a, a chain stitch um, border. I had this, this incredibly really fine silver tinsel thread that was, um, miserable to work with too thin to do anything with but I chain stitched it and then I so I made a big long chain and then I would I'd, um, single crochet or slip stitch crochet all around the edge to get to give it a little weight and to give it this little sparkle <clears throat> so anyway this is the first thing I finished this week and also um, if we go over to we've got the the copper cardigan that I've been working on for a couple of weeks now and I kept running out of yarn and you know because the pattern it said nine ounces but ten ounces for safety but it doesn't tell you what type um, I think I've been kidding myself that that what I got was fingering weight I'm pretty sure it's worsted weight I, I used to be clearer on like what the different weights of yarn were but I'm a lot less clear on that now um, I'm, I'm very unclear like what the weights of yarn are. I think I'm gonna get one of those those wraps per inch tools so I can like do a better educated guess. I know what I like, but I don't necessarily, it's just, it's harder for me to classify like numerically like what the weights are. So anyway, I think as of right now, this sweater is is in the neighborhood of about 21 ounces, which is a lot. And it's alpaca and alpaca. I don't know if you've ever knit with alpaca or 100% alpaca. This is like 80%. It's um, it's heavy and it's warm. It's ridiculously warm. Um, so anyway, this is coming along. You can see. I don't know if you can see the knitting needle still hanging off of it. I still have to do the the last of the border, and I need to obviously weave in all my ends because they're. Um, can you see that? All the ends are sticking out. For now, what I've done is I've. Um, these are cuffed in like cuffs. And so what I've done is I've just held them up kind of like with stitch markers just to hold them up for the, the video. I haven't figured out how to secure them yet. I think like cufflinks, because then there's some other parts in the book where Virginia mentions cufflinks. She doesn't mention that here. And a lot of times she'll say, to, you know, she'll have a whole section like about how to wear the garment to wear, you know, style it like this over your head with a, you know, this clip and you clip, clip and you know, whatever. She doesn't have any of that here. And also this sweater doesn't have any buttonholes. In the original book, she has, um, it looks like a little clip right here. And the model is kind of like hunched over. Uh, I'll show you in the, the book. I'm, I just, I don't know how, um, here we go. So this is the only picture we have and she's, I think there's a little clippy thing right here and probably like another one over here, but, and maybe some cufflinks, I don't know. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure what to do. If you have any ideas about what kinds of closures that I should use for that, like how do you, how do you close, how do you close a sweater without buttonholes? Like what, what type of, I don't know, <laughs> like cufflinks in the belly area? If you know, do let me know because I'd like to know. So anyway, this is copper cardigan and um, I should have that finished next week. Probably. That's what I thought last week. Anyway, <laughs> still working on the copper card again. All right. Okay. So do you remember how I talked about how there was one pamphlet, a one number knitting pamphlet that I have been able to track down and I got it from a University of Chicago library and it showed off one page to you 
because um, oh hook and eye oh that's a good idea okay yeah and that's that's basically invisible okay um, so let me show you this this is that that pamphlet from that was advertised I think it was advertised in the 1944 edition of McCall's I think um, maybe 45 I'm not sure but anyway so I got a copy of this and and um, I started knitting one of one of the patterns and the the reason the reason I started knitting one of these was because in the last two weeks I've gotten invited to two baby showers and I don't usually get invited to baby showers because um, because <laughs> I don't <laughs> probably for the same reason I I don't ever get invited to weddings <laughs> because I just I stay home <laughs> but anyway I got invited to two baby showers and suddenly I'm like all right I guess I need to knit some baby things um, and so so here I am. I'm. I, I wanted to knit a baby a baby thing, but I wanted to do it in garter stitch, you know. And I wanted to make it from Virginia's um, Virginia stuff. And so I settled on this little hat here. And you can't really tell. You can't really tell like what it is. It's you can tell what this sweater thing is. Um, when I saw this advertised in the the magazine, I, I read baby jacket and bed jacket and baby sack and I was thinking like a like a sleeper sack like a sleeping bag with arms you know for the, the baby to sleep in but this is a new word for me s-a-c-q-u-e is like a jacket apparently so I didn't know that before so anyway I'm, I'm working on um, working on the hat and let me go down there this is another reason um, I want to get the the publishing like the copyright transfer done from the copyright office because when I when I talked with the um, the, the girl at the library um, she's like well because I said oh it's you know probably in the public domain it's been like decades and she's like no you don't know that I was like well probably she's like oh you you have to verify first I'm like okay so I'm, I can't share the whole thing but anyway um, pretty sure no one's gonna come after me for showing <laughs> for showing off part of a page so let's take a look at this so this is the hat and what is really interesting to me about this hat is that this style of charting is totally different than the style of charting in the book in the book she everything is based on graph paper and so when she has you pick up around curves, it's it's totally different. Um, but here she actually shows you the curve of how you're supposed to pick up. And so you you cast in your 12 stitches, you knit six ridges, then you knit two in the next color, you pick up around the edge. So this in in here it's charted as it looks, but in the original book it would have been charted totally differently. And so let me show you what that what that looks like. Um, because in the um, the book, she has this is the same the same idea, but she charts it flat on graph paper, and instead she has these little um, these little lines here that tell you how you're supposed to pick up. So with, with unit one, you do, um, you know, you cast on your stitches and you knit some ridges. And then for unit two, starting here, you pick up. So all these, these stitches here for unit two, they're actually wrapped around onto top of unit one. And same here with unit three and unit four. And so what she did is she, ex in this in the book, which was published after this other pamphlet, she has it like all flattened out, which um, is useful for charting, but like for um, the person knitting it, it can be pretty confusing. Um, I, I love, I love how she did this here. And I think it's really, it's really interesting the fact that she you know we get to see like the progression of her charting style um, from this to the graph paper and I'm really I'm glad that we have this to um, 
you know, to use as a reference. Anyway, I thought that was neat. I'm, I'm working on that hat. And as you know, I don't swatch. <laughs> my project is my swatch and it gets me into trouble. And I should know better. I should know better by now, but whatever. <laughs> I love knitting and I love making projects and most of the time it works out some of the time it doesn't and then I just rip it out and that's okay <laughs> oh, there we go hey Stephanie okay so let me show you let me show you what I got going on here um, this I kind of had like a yarn I tried to wind a center pole ball and that usually works really well for me <laughs> and this one oh it it's a it's a tangled mess um but anyway let me show you what i got so this is this is a little baby hat and it's um it's bigger than it should be why because i didn't follow the instructions uh, so the original pattern says that you're supposed to use size eight needles and baby weight yarn I have eight needles. I have like all the sizes of needles, but the yarn that I chose is, um, this yarn is from DJ, Discovery of Stitches. And um, I used a couple of different, I thought they were the same. They looked pretty similar to me. Apparently they weren't enough. Um, but anyway, so this one is like a sock weight and it's got like all these pretty little speckles in it. And it, it reminds me of confetti and I love that. Here's a, here it is see my tangled mess um, I don't have it in a skein anymore otherwise I'd show you the skein but it's you know it's beautiful I love it but this is like a like a sock weight the other yarn that I chose to go with it was more like like a fingering weight <laughs> they felt the same to me but anyway so one is a little thicker one is a little thinner and I thought well it's a little thinner so what I should do instead of using eights I'll use sixes US six and I'll just, um, I'll make, I'll just use a little bit more stitches. <laughs> Did I swatch? No. Um, and I don't have a baby head to try this on because I don't have kids. Um, and honestly, because I should have just checked, I should have checked to see like how big a baby head is supposed to be. But I didn't because I'm not much of a planner. <clears throat> so this says you're supposed to use nine stitches for two inches. So that's four and a half stitches to the inch. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think I got about four and a half stitches to the inch. Pretty close, even on my size six needles. Um, I wasn't sure that I was going to at the beginning. That's why I cast on more stitches. And so the, the instructions here, it says one square is six stitches and six ridges. And so if you're new to, <coughs> if you're new to number knitting, the whole idea of the box number is really is really really important and um, every pattern that that Virginia did it has um, it has a box number down here and in this case the box number is four and so every square on the graph paper represents four stitches and four ridges and so what you would uh, what you would do for this is you would count how many boxes there are. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. There's 12 boxes and each box represents four stitches. And so you'd cast on 48 stitches um, and then you would work four times three is 12 ridges. And so the, the box number is really important. And what I decided to do, because I was using smaller needles and I thought I'd get fewer stitches per the inch, I changed the box number. And I changed it drast <laughs> too drastically. It was supposed to be six. I changed it to eight. And I thought, that should be fine. It will still fit a baby. <laughs> Surely, it will still fit a baby. <laughs> and babies' heads get, like, proportionally, their heads are a lot bigger than, like, adult heads. You know, if you have the body, with the, the head size, like babies have really big heads. And I thought it, it should work. It should work just fine. Right? Right? <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I'm almost done with this hat. I'm pretty sure the hat is going to fit me. 
Um, let's see. <laughs> this is a, like, I got my needles on it right now, so that I can't, but um, this is like a repeating, <laughs> repeating problem that I have, is that I knit hats too large, and then um, I have to give them away because they don't fit right. <laughs> This might be another one of those, but I was thinking this, it's its a really fine yarn, because like, who else? Like, if you have a sock weight yarn, would you really knit it on size six needles? No, you wouldn't. And normally I wouldn't either, but Virginia said, you know, use the larger needles. Anyway, so that's what I did. It's, um, I, I think one of the reasons it seems a little, a little loosey-goosey to me um, is, is because is because it's a sock yarn and it's it's tightly spun, it's uh, super wash and it's um, it's designed to be knitted. That yarn is designed to be knitted tightly for socks and it's designed to wear hard, which is great um, if you're knitting socks. But if you're knitting a tightly spun yarn on big needles at, at a very loose gauge, it's not. There's no extra fuzziness. To um, to fill in any of those holes, and so it just it doesn't feel it doesn't feel quite right. Like this this um, scarfy thing that I made, it's got it's got a little bit of extra fuzz in it, um, and it's got grippiness to it. It's not super wash, and so it, it's gonna it's gonna fill in the holes more, um, and it's gonna deal like better with a looser gauge. Yeah, and so anyway, this the issues I have with this little hat thing that I made, it has nothing to do at all with the yarn. It was my my choice of like I I think I chose the wrong I think I chose the wrong pattern for this yarn. Like if I maybe if I was to re-knit this on like size threes using the same stitches, then I'd actually have a baby hat. <laughs> and the fabric wouldn't be so, it wouldn't be so loose, I think I'd be happier with it. So I might do that. But anyway, this is the baby hat that I've been, that I've been working on. Oh no, it's tangled up with my, my bodice blouse cape scarf. <sighs> oh well, I'll, I'll get that sorted out. Okay, so let's talk about the, I may have inadvertently solved my Tarzetto hat issue. The Tarzetto hat was too big. Yeah, but I found someone with big hair to give it to. Because <laughs> I have several Tarzetto hats. Karen, what do you mean? Which Tarzetto hat? Because I think I did like three iterations of that. And I have, I have two of them here. One of them was, um, this is a pattern I came up with a while ago. Um, one of them was like slouchy. And then um, one of them was was stiffer. It was like with a bulky weight yarn and it was stiffer and it had this like smurf shape on the top. So anyway, which Tarzetto were you talking about? Let me know. <clears throat> All right, um, we are working on, oh, linen blouse. Let me show you that. And then we'll talk about the knit along stuff. Okay, linen, there she is. All right, linen blouse. Let me show you the one in the book. Um, linen blouse. All right, so I think all of Virginia's um, short sleeve sweaters and sleeveless sweaters in the book, I can only think of one of them that's made in wool. Well, I could be wrong. I'm often wrong. But like a lot of them are made in, um, in linen blends or um, she'll specify nylon. She specified that before. Sometimes she doesn't specify fiber at all. She'll just say, you know, baby weight yarn with like no <laughs> recommendation as to like what, what you should do. But this one, she calls it specifically linen blouse. 
and um, hers was in linen. I had made an, another one in linen. It was a linen cotton blend, but this time I decided to try a. Um, I decided to try it in a wool blend. This is a Peruvian Highland wool that I made. Oh, check this out. This is important. This is important, ladies. Remember to have a strapless bra bound and fitted to uh, your figure as a bodice to match each suit. The line of the color beneath your number knitted blouse is always more beautiful for being unbroken from armpit to skirt hem, while the shoulders are always lovelier without straps. Yes. <laughs> Get yourself a strapless bra, my friends. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the latest one that I made. And so this is this is the linen blouse. And well, mine's wool, mine's not linen. So I think we need to come up with a, a better name for this because obviously this is not a linen blouse. But um, the way it um, it works is you start with there's divided not divided there's nothing divided about this no minor shapes at all it's all squares and um, triangles so you start out with four squares and then you knit um, you you knit a couple of bigger squares and then a couple of um, smaller squares and they're they're smaller in that some of the shapes use a different um, they use a different needle size. All the shapes in blue, they use, uh, I think it was size five, and all the shapes in orange, and I added these colors, by the way, uh, all the shapes in orange use, I believe, a seven. And, th and the front is supposed to be exactly the same as the back. And um, yeah, so what, what happened when I did it, and I found the same thing happened on the first time I did this, I knit it just like she said, and the first time it was like all like, um, it's like baggy up here. It looked like a diaper. In you know how like when you put a diaper on a kid and there's like so much fabric there and it like all bunches up. That's how it felt here, and it looked goofy. And so the first time I made this, I ripped out these little side triangles and I knit them on the smaller size. But this time I was like, you know what? I'm doing it in wool. I'm just gonna do it again, just the way Virginia says, and see what happens. And I did, and it was like all bunchy right here. And so again, I ripped out those um, those side triangles and I knit them on the smaller size, and it fits lovely. It's it. I feel like. I'm a little I'm a little small for it. Like I'm five four and I've got a thirty six inch bust, and I feel like for someone that's got a few inches and maybe has a little bit bigger frame, this would fit better. So if I was to do this again, I think um, I think I would maybe make it a little smaller because it says you know fits size um, you know. Does she even say what size it is? No. I think I think she mentioned somewhere in there that it's a thirty six. Like if you measure from here to here, there should be nine inches across the, um, you know, the square. And so each one of those would be 39 plus nine is 18 times two, 36. But it just, it fits a little loose on me. So I think if I was to make it again, and I probably will, I'll just, you know, cast on fewer stitches and change, change my box number. Um, Cause in this one, the box number is, um, is three, but I couldn't calculate it. I can figure out a way to calculate it so that it would be, uh, instead of you know everything on like a 12 by 12 stitch square, I would do it maybe like on a, a 10 by 10 or an 11 by 11, that would probably work fine. Anyway, I'll wear this next week so you can see it. So you can see it on. I do love, I love this tank top. It's nice. It's a little big for me, um, but it's lovely and it fits great and it's reversible front and back. All right, so our knit along, we are working on two, two different patterns. We are working on bodice blouse with cape scarf and Hampton shirt. And um, if you don't have those uh, patterns yet yeah, they uh, they are linked in the in the notes below 
um, so let me let me show you them in the book the original book so this is um, this is the original sweater it was it's just a series of divided squares um, going kind of like in a ski track fashion kind of you know just back and forth and there's ribbing at the bottom and there's smaller divided squares at the neckline it is is very basic um, if you wanted to taper it um, you could maybe use bigger needle sizes up here and have uh, smaller needle sizes down at the waist that'll give you a, a more fitted waist which is nice um, but if you don't need or don't want that you can use the same needles all the way all the way up and um, and that's fine too so this is the first one I actually I have not I have not cast mine on yet because I got sidetracked with that baby hat um, but I'll probably do that this week I wanted to I wanted to finish the the linen blouse and finish the um, the baby hat and and just get a couple of things wrapped up before I cast on another another item now um, if you already have a copy of the book the the instructions in the paragraph text do not match the chart the math is wrong um, so what I did is I I fixed the math I um, I made a new chart and um, that is available for download. I think I have it up just until May 5th, um, but click on the link in the, in the notes below. You can download this chart. And um, also, if you click on this little, um, or I guess you'll take a picture of it. I should add a link to that. Uh, that little QR code will take you to a page on my website where you can like plug in your, your numbers. So um, like if you don't have a size 36 inch chest, you have a different size chest, you can just like plug in your gauge plug in your um, your chest measurement and it'll tell you what your box number should be um, and how many stitches each one of your squares will be and all of those instructions are down in the, um, the links below now um, I believe we we have a thread on the in the Ravelry group already about that and and one person has already started adding the project and the first thing she did was she swatched she made four swatches <laughs> four different needle sizes and like big swatches too and then she chose the one that she liked best which I thought was like oh that's lovely that is so smart <laughs> I should do that sometime <laughs> I should do that but do I no <laughs> oh life goals um okay so um if you have those your um your projects in the Ravelry group you can ask ask questions about that and you know show off your work we can track each other's progress uh, we did that we just wrapped up a tropical leaf car throw knit along and we got you know a bunch of people a bunch I don't know like five <laughs> five or six maybe seven people in there which is great um, you know showing off their projects so it's fun to knit along all at the same time so that's more of like a basic a basic number knitting project um, if you're you know just kind of getting familiar with the method and um, for those of you who are more adventuresome as Virginia would say there is bodice blouse with cape scarf and this chart mmm um, I let me show you the original one because it was it was terrifying <laughs> it was terrifying um, and Virginia said that that it's easier to knit than it appears uh, on paper <laughs> and you know she's right she is right because this is just oh my goodness it's terrifying and she gave you a road map of what needle sizes to use where um, but then so for like three years I thought this this whole thing was just one page oh no there's a second page and so um, and this is all for one sweater so what I did is I spent some time with it and I made sense of it um, there we go so the different colors now those indicate different needle sizes and so you can look and see what you know what the color of the square is and then correspond it with the needle sizes down here and so for unit number one 
you will cast on your stitches and then um, work a divided square. And then for unit number two, you'll pick up and then cast on some more stitches and you're knitting another divided square, but you do it like this one is on a six and this one is on a seven. And then you get to over here, this number unit number three, that's on a size 13. And that's about, that's about where I'm at right now. And so I wanted to show you how, um, how that looks um, so far. And I know, oh gosh, it's all, it's all tangled up in a baby hat. Oh dear. <laughs> oh my goodness. Kelly, what have you done? All right, press onward. So let's, uh, let's do this one. So you, this is unit one. You start out by casting on your stitches and then we work a, um, oh, here we go, I'm sorry. You cast on your stitches and you work a divided square. This is on a size six. And then switch to number seven needle. And then you pick up your stitches and then you cast on these stitches and work another divided square. And it is very easy, it is very, very easy to lose track of which side is the right side. And so, I got a while ago, I don't know if I showed you guys these yet. I got these little, um, these little stitch marker things. They're numbers. Can you see that? They're little, they've got little numbers on them. Um, like this one is one and then somewhere in here I have two. I should, you know, put that on. And then I've, I've got up through 40. And so as you're, working these units, you can just clip these little numbered markers on there to let you know what is the right versus the wrong side. But then also, um, like, you know, what unit you're on, because sometimes it is really easy to lose track of what unit you're on. Like the, that linen blouse, that thing was a nightmare trying to figure out which, um, you know, which unit I was on. And there's a section in the book where Virginia talks about, I think it was on that pattern, she says that you should, um, you should tie um, numbered price tags onto your different units. Because I guess, you know, they didn't have stuff like this back in the 40s, uh, but they did have price tags, and so you just tie on the little paper price tag, and that will help, help you keep track. Um, but anyway, I got these little things, and they, they're nice, they're helpful. So they'll, they'll help me keep my sanity. And I got these from a company, it was on Etsy. It's called hideandsheep.net. And I think you can, you can specify, like if you want these little, I don't know if these are lobster clasps or what, but this little like clippy kind, or if you want like the kind that just, um, that don't open and close, I don't know why you would want that, but like um, the kind that just like slips, slips on your needle. And then she can also do them with like letters. Like I've seen, I've seen other Etsy shops do that where instead of um, um, numbers, they'll do like SSK or K2 together or you know, whatever, they'll have the little symbols on there. So that's kind of nice. But yeah, these, these are really helpful for this. And so for this, um, I, I, was, I was a little stumped by this at first because I was like, this is a sleeve. So this is, you know, one half of the sweater um, and there'll be another half here. And then you do the sleeves. Um, but what I was confused about at first before I, I reread the chart again, I was like, okay, this is on a six and this is on a seven. Like the difference between these two is not very much. But like if I was to look at my, my waist measurement versus my bust measurement, like this would need to be bigger. But then I realized in the chart, this is the back. This is the back. So if we go back to the, the chart, this is the back. So you're starting with unit one, you're working up the left. I guess this would be the right back. So you start at the right low back and then go to the right upper back. 
and then go to the right sleeve and then the right the right cuff so it it's not it's not as scary as I thought it would be at first once I figured out the chart it's actually not bad it's it's just mitered squares and I can do that um, working on the the bigger um, the bigger needles is kind of a challenge so allow yourself a little bit of mental space to to get accustomed to that because like if you if you're like trying to work at a really unfamiliar gauge on like really big needles and someone's trying to have a conversation with you <laughs> it I might just give yourself a little space <laughs> so that you don't you don't get a little snippy with <laughs> with your loved ones when you're trying to work on your knitting project no you guys would never do that no it's, it's just me <laughs> oh dear yeah all right so that's bodice blouse um one other thing i did i did want to note in here is that um I've been struggling with the the sleeves of the copper cardigan because they are um, they're very they're very wide they're very wide I mean I could fit like I could fit my leg in these sleeves they're huge and and there are successive needle sizes going down but it's still it's very it's very big um, but one thing I note that on this bodice blouse that's really interesting is that she does something on this that she hasn't done before with any of the other sweaters that I've seen. Probably half of the sweaters in the book are long sleeves and half are short sleeves. Um, but what she did here is the, the cuff is, she has you pick up every other stitch for the cuff. So you're going to pick up all along here, but she only um, represents, like the stitch count is represented by the blocks here in green, but by picking up every other stitch, it's gonna make this like real blousey kind of a sleeve. Um, yeah, you see that? It's real, um, it's blousey. And she did that, that, same, that same technique on the, um, that little baby hat that I'm working on. So I, I know probably those of you who are working on this, they're, you're probably not quite there yet, but I, I wanted to show you uh, real quick something that you can do to make that pick up edge look better. So if I was to, if I was to pick, well, let's do this one. That's a little bit better. Um, whoop, I'm back. So if I was to pick up these stitches here, if I just pick up every single stitch or every other stitch, they get really like, um, really loosey goosey and it looks bad. And so what I'm gonna do, what I did on my baby hat, cause it uses that, that same technique, is instead of picking up every single stitch just through there, I'm gonna go through two stitches at at a time and pick them up together and then the next one I would also go through the next two stitches at a time and pick them up together and what that does is it just it tightens up this edge and so that it's it's gonna look um, it's gonna look a lot nicer than if you just pick up every other stitch because what that does is it stretches out <laughs> it's gonna stretch out this one this one stitch and it just it makes the whole thing wonky so that's just a little tip for you <clears throat> when you get there I know probably I'm not even there yet um, but I was there in the baby hat and that's how I knew to to do that okay um, so we've got how many of you have cast on your um, your Hampton sh Hampton shirt Oh, Stephanie says she prints out a black and white copy of the pattern and highlights with the highlighter each unit that she's completed. And the first unit she always marks. That's a good idea. Yeah, that is a good idea. 
Sometimes though, if the units are all, they're all the same, like the linen blouse, it starts with four, um, four rectangles, or no, four squares, and they all are exactly the same, and so it's easy to get like, it's spun around and flipped over and, and that sort of thing. Um, but that is a good idea. So have any of you, um, have any of you cast on your, your knit along for your bodice blouse or for your, your Hampton shirt? I'm excited to see them. Um, I haven't cast mine on yet, but I probably will this week. And I think, I don't have the yarn here, but I will next week. Mm. You know, the, the finished corners are, um, there's, there's Nishibi, so she's not, she's cast on hers, but she's not happy with the finished corners. You know, it all comes out. And because once you start picking up from the different edges, it all just like, it, it, it's amazing how much it just evens out. Um, so I say that, but I, I'm, a, I'm willing one to just like let a lot of things slide. <laughs> But if you swatch in advance, maybe, maybe you're more persnickety than me. I'd, I'm going to say probably so. I did want to show you guys some new acquisitions I got this week. <clears throat> oh, good gracious. Hold on. So I got a little, I got a little care package. Yes from DJ Discovery of Stitches. I'm gonna put a link to her shop in the, the description. Okay, so DJ has these mystery bags that um, they're like a lot of one-off yarns that she's dyed. Some of them are worsted, some of them are bulky, some of them are DK, there's laceway, there's all kinds. And so I picked, I got one and I picked out some of my favorites and I just wanted to show them to you. So this one, I think I've got two of these. This is like a, a bulky weight, um, and it's, um, I believe, I believe this one was cake dyed. And it's, um, I, I'm thinking it's non-superwash. So this would be really good for a hat. Let's go a little wider. There we go. Yes. And then um, she's been doing some, um, she's been doing a lot with purple lately. This is, oh gosh, how many plies is this? This is like a, like a, six ply um, and what she does is she she sprinkles on she sprinkles on the dye and some of the dyes they'll um, they'll break into different colors like this one has got pinks and purples and violets there's even one little dot of yellow and there's some blues and it's just it's scrumptious and then I also there's these three together I think I think what she did with these ones is she sprayed them with um, Wilton's Violet. Pretty sure it was Wilton's Violet, like the food coloring. But like if you get the gel kind of food coloring, you can use it to dye yarn, which is awesome. And so she like sprayed them with a spray bottle. So um, and this is all this is all fingering weight, um, 462 yards. Yeah, it's a 75, 75, 25. And these go lovely together. <clears throat> and then the last two I wanted to show you, because I love I love purple. Purples are my favorite. But she also does a lot of um, like kind of wilder colors that are not not just speckles, but like um, a lot of stripes and, and hand painted kind of stuff. So we got like this. I'm feeling like this is. Um, does it have a color name? It doesn't have a color name. It's probably a one of a kind. Um, but I feel like this is like a sports team or a joker or something as far as the colorway. And then we got this nice Americana one. But so her little, um, her little, disc, um, they're not really little. They're like, they're big bags of, you know, mystery yarn. And they've got, you know, all the whole variety of different sizes and, um, you know, colors and stuff. And um, yeah, check them out. They're awesome. And the last thing I wanted to show you was... <clears throat> So, DJ also sews, which is awesome. So here's a, a bag that she, that she made recently. It's knitted fabric. And so I don't, I don't know if you know this, but I, so 
I have the, a whole Etsy shop where I do custom mugs and and knitting stitches. And this is one of my most popular designs. Um, that's like a snowflake design. And DJ asked if I could if I could put it on fabric, and I did. And so she got it, and then she made this lovely bag out of it. And it's I love it. I made it for her in all the different colors, <laughs> which is fun. And if you open it up and look at it on the inside, it's even got pockets on the inside, a whole bunch of pockets, and it's uh, it's lined and it's you know it's got that nice knitting fabric on the inside too, and it's got this cute little zipper pull. And this is all uh, all this white is um, it's marine grade vinyl, and so it's really sturdy. And it also has a a little um, it's like I don't know what the technical name is if in the sewing world because I'm not in the sewing world. It's like a triangle bag. I thought I saw it called something else recently, but I could be mistaken. And so it's this little, it's this little matching triangle bag. So this is like a really good one skein project bag kind of a thing, and it matches the big bag. And it the, this set it also comes with these. Um, these cute little like rainbow colored minis, which I think are precious. So anyway, that's from that's from DJ. I think we're um, I think we're going to end up using this as a giveaway, which is pretty exciting. So stay tuned for that. Thanks DJ for for the lovely the lovely gift. We're going to enjoy that. Whoever whoever wins it is going to love that. All right, so it looks like some people are getting started on their their Hampton shirt, so that's exciting. Um, if you have any questions or you know comments or whatever, you can um, just ask a question in the Ravelry group. That it, it's not super active right now, just because our um, our group is kind of small. It the group was more active. The Ravelry group was more active, like back in 2016 <laughs> when I started working on number knitting, and then it kind of like fell off for a while. But it's you know it's getting going back again, um, and so it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of recent posts. But I guarantee you, I check it every day, and I'm pretty sure other people do as well. So if you have any questions, um, you know about the patterns, reach out on um, in the Ravelry group, and we will get you set up. All right, so it's seven. It's almost seven thirty. So um, I think that's it for today. As far as next week, um, did did we have anything in particular that we were going to work on? Um, I know I'm going to, you know, keep working on my projects, but usually I like to do a um, like a to do list of the things that that you all need or want me to do and so I can work on those during the week and March 4th and then you know come back with them done um, and so I'm gonna finish my copper cardigan this week um, so I'll put that on the list and um, I'm gonna cast on my Hampton shirt that's still on my list from last week but I'm actually gonna do it this time yeah, so those are those are my two things. If I hear anything back from um, from the company that owns McCall's, because a couple couple of weeks ago I submitted a form on their website asking if they still had like copyright protection, because it's owned by some company called the Meredith Company in Europe, or there was a, a bunch of changes of hands of who owns McCall's, um, and so I don't know I don't know who. I don't know who owns it, and I was I was hoping to do kind of like the 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 free route of copyright search before I went and paid four hundred dollars. So I'm still waiting to hear back. But if I do hear back from them, I will let you know. I do not have high hopes on that. Um, I will also put together a list of um, which um, McCall's magazines I McCall's needlework magazines specifically. I'm only interested in the needlework magazines and so I'll put together a list on my website of which ones I have and which ones I need yeah all right friends this has been this has been another fun chit chat thanks for joining me and um, I guess that's it for now and I will see you next week thanks for coming <laughs>